there's a lot of banging in my background. <laughs> trying. We are live. Perfect. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah LaVon and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I always say that I'm all I'm so excited, but I kind of live in a state of excitement. So that's nothing new, but I truly am extremely excited to have Sarah here, which is easy name name wise. So when in doubt, go with Sarah, Sarah, who is the vagina whisperer, which I love your name as well. She <laughs> is on Instagram. If you don't follow her on Instagram, head on over to Instagram and follow her over there. She is a pelvic floor therapist and is here today to talk all about our pelvic floor. So if you don't know what the pelvic floor is, it's that only you have one inside of you. And so we're gonna talk and answer a bunch of your most common questions. We're gonna learn what the pelvic floor is. We're gonna talk about sex because that's a huge heavy hitter. We're gonna talk about peeing yourself, all the things. But let me tell you just a little bit more about Sarah. Sarah Reardon is on a mission to revolutionize the way we approach women's health and a, and a radical honesty and willingness and open to openly discuss often taboo topics, which sounds very aligned with me. If you follow me at all, you know that like, I like to go there. My most recent one was, video was on newborn poop, on meconium and then hemorrhoids. So we like talking about this stuff, which I'm sure you can talk about as well. She is a doctor of physical therapy, graduating from Washington University in St. Louis and a board certified women's health physical therapist. Sarah specializes in the treatment on, the pel on pelvic floor disorders, including changes that occur during pregnancy and postpartum recovery. She is a pelvic health physical therapist in New Orleans, Louisiana. So shout out to New Orleans and founder of the Vagina Whisperer, an online resource for pelvic health education to support, empower, and educate women worldwide. Can you see why I would want her on this channel? If you were here yesterday, we talked all things breastfeeding and literally education, support, and empowerment was exactly what the theme was. And so I'm so excited to have her here. Without further ado, let's get into all the things. You ready Thanks, for Sarah. it? Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. Of course. I'm so excited about this. If you don't, if you know me at all or you followed me at all, you know that I'm kind of obsessed with the pelvic floor. I'm a secret wannabe pelvic floor therapist. Um, I am like a pelvic floor connoisseur. We teach this stuff with bundle birth nurses. And so I first and foremost, before we get into anything else, there's probably a few of you out there that are like pelvic floor. Maybe you've heard that. Maybe you've heard of like your mom that pees herself. That's a common thing that people think, <clears throat> excuse me. And so I want to ask you if maybe you could just explain to us what is the pelvic floor first and how it maybe affects our lives. And do we all have one, even men? Yeah, we all have one. Males, females, everyone in between, we all have a pelvic floor. And I want to demystify that because I feel like often people think, oh, pelvic floor, what is that? But if you kind of see it, it makes a little bit more sense. So I've got my handy dandy pelvic model here. I love our pelvic. You can, see, got the pelvis. <laughs> you can see the pubic bone is here in the front. And then the low back, sacrum, and tailbone are in the back. So the way that we're sitting now, your pelvis is just like this. Mm -hmm. And then at the base of your pelvis is a basket of muscles. And all of this red and pink area here, this is what we call your pelvic floor muscles. So these are muscles, ligaments, fascia, and they are working for us all throughout the day. And we don't even always realize it because they're just working for us. Mm -hmm. And we often don't realize we even have a pelvic floor until maybe something is going wrong with it. Mm -hmm. So these muscles help support your pelvic organs your bladder, which holds urine, your rectum, which holds poop, and your uterus, which holds a growing baby during pregnancy, all rest inside of here, kind of like a basket. And then this outer layer of muscles also has the clitoris, the opening for the urethra where urine exits, the vaginal opening for vaginal intercourse and vaginal birth, and then the anal sphincter for poops. So you can see, again, this muscle holds in pee, holds in poop, um, helps with intercourse, vaginal birth, and supports your organs throughout the day. So again, it's working all of the time yeah. and we often just don't talk about it. So we don't really kind of know what it does or what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Cool. And so how does it, how does it, like, what does a healthy pelvic floor look like? 
versus so a healthy body. pelvic or feel like so a healthy pelvic floor i mean you've got muscles all throughout your body in your biceps your back your, your legs and these are muscles like any other muscles in your body and that's why as physical therapists we often hear like i didn't know there was physical therapy for that but it's because these are muscles and that's what we specialize in so if you're able to hold in your urine, hold in your poop until you get to the restroom and then you can relax those muscles well to empty your bladder and empty your bowels, that's a healthy pelvic floor. If you're able to, um, you know, you've got some tension and tone in those vaginal wall muscles, but in order to insert a tampon or a speculum or a dildo or a penis, those muscles can relax to accommodate insertion of something into the vagina. Um, and then again, if you are able to, you know, support a growing baby without leaking or hemorrhoids or um, pressure or heaviness, that's all healthy. Where we see some things go differently is during pregnancy, these muscles can get lengthened or weakened over time. You know, we get those little emails that like, that say your baby's the size of a blueberry, then it's the size of an avocado, then it's the size of a pumpkin. Yeah. Well, a blueberry in a hammock is not going to cause that much change, but a pumpkin in a hammock is going to cause that hammock to sink yeah. a little bit lower, get a little bit more lengthened. And that's how your pelvic floor changes during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And then you go through birth and it doesn't just spring back together afterwards. So that's where we see a lot of women postpartum for pelvic floor changes. Mm -hmm. And so an unhealthy pelvic floor would look like what? So, and I hate even to use the word unhealthy, but I want to say like incoordinated or weak or tense or something like that where- Abnormal? That, or we say dysfunctional, but I feel like that's like not the best word either. So um, yeah, we can just say like, you know, it's not working optimally. So one of the things is if you, you know, again, these organs should hold up. I mean, these muscles should hold up your organs. So if you have heaviness or pressure, if you have urinary leakage with coughing, sneezing, running, jumping, mm -hmm. laughing, any of those things, um, if you're unable to make it to the bathroom in time and hold your urine in or hold your poops in, um, those would all typically be signs of maybe weakness. Some other things that can happen to the pelvic floor we don't often talk about, or it's not just weakness, but it could also be tension, which could cause um, painful sex. Um, challenges relaxing the muscles during birth to allow baby to kind of exit the birth canal, um, hemorrhoids, tailbone pain, um, vaginal pain, you know, all of these things where we think really pain and tension and also difficulty emptying your bladder or constipation. Those are other areas where we may see um, tension in the pelvic floor where those muscles again are not working optimally. Fascinating. So this was like huge for me. Like when I, cause as a nurse, I never, I don't even remember like a module on the pelvic floor. I'm not going to lie. Like how, like these, we study the muscle groups and like anatomy, physiology, but the, the pelvic floor, the, I think this is why I'm so obsessed because I'm like, wait a second, there's like a whole area of the body that applies to obstetrics that I don't totally get. And so I think one of the things that was so surprising to me was this idea of either too weak or too strong or tension or like looseness yep, yeah, or whatever. And so my question, this is going to turn into a question, but I think for me, what was so fascinating is I think a lot of times we think of pelvic floor of what we know of is like your Kegel muscles, which we're going to talk about Kegels in a second, mm -hmm. but like you think about squeezing your pelvic floor and everything like, Oh, I'm peeing myself maybe. And that's why I have a pelvic floor issue. But there's also this whole other side. That's the tension side of the pelvic mm -hmm. floor. Totally. And so how do you know, and this can lead into what does a pelvic floor therapist do, but how do you know between the two? Because my script is, I usually say for, for mamas that they need to see a pelvic floor therapist to be able to tell them like, and assess their pelvic floor to see like, is it too strong or is it too weak? And both sides can cause issues. Right. And so what you, you kind of mentioned the sides, but like, say I'm at home and I'm in the rural areas of like Africa somewhere. And I am like, maybe I have a pelvic floor issue. How would they be able to maybe see some pretty like standard signs that there could be one or the other. And then what does a pelvic, would a, how would a pelvic floor therapist help? And I say pelvic floor therapist, but I know there's physiotherapy and what yeah. you know, yourself, so, pelvic health, yeah. physical yeah. therapy. Yeah. Like, so they're all kind of the same physiotherapist, physical therapist, same profession, pelvic floor therapist, pelvic health therapist, same profession. We just kind of don't have a standard lingo necessarily, <laughs> but we all are muscle specialists who um, kind of are focused on this area of the pelvis that does involve bladder health, bowel health, sexual health, pregnancy, postpartum, menopause, all the things. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, it's, I, I really focus on, you know, how we talk about tension and weakness is it of these muscles. It's like any other muscle in your body. You could have neck pain, but is that neck pain because of weakness somewhere or tension somewhere? You don't really know until you see the specialist. So I don't like to base it off of symptoms. Like if you leak urine, you've got to do Kegels. Or if you have painful sex and you've got to do relaxation stuff, you don't really know. So seeing a specialist is hands down the number one way to do it. And if you're going to see a specialist, they need to be trained on doing an internal pelvic floor muscle assessment which we'll go over and what to expect in a session. Okay. But you can't have somebody that just says like, oh, you've got these symptoms, go do Kegels. You've got tailbone pain, go do this. Like it doesn't, you can't assess someone by just hearing their symptoms. So, but some of the things I think that are important for people at home to know is like, what is normal? And if you're outside of that range of normal, you likely need to see a specialist. So for urination, it's normal to pee every two to four hours during the day and zero to two times at night with no Even pregnancy. Well, pregnancy, you're going to be kind of closer to the like one or two hours or um, during the day or two to three times at night. But what happens is after pregnancy, we stay in those habits where we peel, we go to the bathroom all the time or Just every time. You're used to it. What's that? Just because you're used to it? You're used to it because you're, you get in these behavioral patterns of like, oh, I, you know, I'm leaving the house. So let me just go pee just in case. Yeah. But you really should listen for your bladder to give you the urge to go. But, you know, we rush around, we push our pee out, we do all these things that aren't optimal habits and they just stick with us for life. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of normal and it's never normal to leak. It may be common, but it's not normal. So you may experience leakage a little bit in the third trimester of pregnancy. You may experience leakage a little bit in that fourth trimester or first, you know, three months postpartum. But if you're experiencing leakage after that, that three months mark of postpartum, like you need to see a specialist, even with a cough, a sneeze, a laugh, because it doesn't necessarily get better. It will just maybe potentially get worse. And then, you know, we end up in like a commercial for pads later on. <laughs> um, so that's one thing. The other thing is pooping. You shouldn't have to strain when you poop. It's normal to poop three times a week to three times a day. So mm -hmm. if you find yourself outside of that range and you're straining or it's hard, or you've got to take laxatives, another sign you may need to see a specialist or intercourse. Intercourse should not be painful ever. It mm -hmm. should be pleasurable and it shouldn't even just be tolerable. It should like not be like, oh, I can take it. It's like, it should be pleasurable and enjoyable and um, not painful. It may be a little bit uncomfortable the first one or two times after giving birth, vaginally or by cesarean. But again, if it persists, then you need to see a specialist. So those are all kind of common that signs. That I feel like is like kind of revolutionary potentially for people. Like guys, if you're peeing yourself ever and maybe like baby moves and like really like, whoa, that was a lot. And yeah. they like hit your bladder or something like, whatever but otherwise if you're peeing yourself ever and or you're having painful sex like live your best life that's I mean, yeah expensive. and it's one of those things that we've been told for these generations of like just deal with it or welcome to motherhood and i'm like no, right that is right not our destiny and yeah we may have little issues i mean i have a vagina i have two babies i like have little issues i have to manage but i know that i have to manage them i don't think that this is just my normal life now right Right. Exactly. So if they were to see you or anyone, um, what would that look like to see a pelvic floor therapist? So, you know, a lot of us do, most of us do in-person sessions. Many of us do virtual sessions as well, just with healthcare right now and the pandemic and the ability to use virtual platforms like this. And in in-person session, they're usually an hour long, um, at least in my practice, and they're one-on-one -on -one in a private treatment room. So you shouldn't be in like a big physical therapy gym. It should be a private treatment room. And we literally just sit and talk for the first half hour. And no matter what you're coming in for, it could be back pain during pregnancy. It could be pooping problems postpartum, but we go through everything, sexual health, bladder health, um, oh. you know, um, bowel health, exercise, all of what is your daily life like? Because I want to know, like, maybe there are other issues that you don't think are pelvic floor related, but they actually are. Like, what's then, the most common things you would see that you're that people are like, wait, that's my pelvic floor? Yeah. So, gosh, let's see. Um, you know, teaching people how to do a Kegel properly for the first time, like they're like, oh, that's yeah. a Kegel, or pe teaching people how to like relax their pelvic floor to poop or prepare for birth they're like oh that's what that is yeah or, you know, anything like that it's kind of like and oh, symptoms I wise like they would have you said back pain 
is one thing that like could be related to your pelvic floor? Back pain, pelvic organ prolapse, diastasis recti of the abdominal wall, also commonly affiliated with, um, with pelvic floor issues. So it's all connected. Like our abs are connected to our pelvic floors, connected to our hips and thighs and back. Like we look at the whole area. So yeah. then I'll look at your back. I'll look at your tummy. I'll assess for an abdominal separation or any scars that you may have in the area. And then we do an right. intravaginal muscle assessment. So that means Internal. like- We go in there. That I think is like, I told somebody recently, one of my clients, I was like, you got to see a pelvic floor therapist. Honestly, guys, here's like one of my side tips. When I'm talking to pregnant people, if like you have your OB, you have me or a birth coach or some sort of like a childbirth educator, educator helping you along the way, the other supplements that to me are non-negotiables and I think is a huge deficit we have in the United States that a lot of other countries do have more access to would be pelvic floor therapy. So find mm -hmm. your pelvic floor therapist during pregnancy that yep. you can see, they can assess, they can help prep you for birth. And we'll get more into that in a second, but you have your pelvic floor therapist, prenatal chiropractor is the other one. And then breastfeeding support. Yeah. Those are like, I like your, if you have those as your team, you're set. Yeah. And, and I agree with all of those, like, and I think there's two kind of tricky things is that one, we need access to those. So like, we need to be able to go on your website and be like, these are educators in childbirth. These are people who can help prepare me for birth. It's like a marathon. You don't just like go run a race and never train. So yeah. you need cool. guidance, you need training. Same thing for your pelvic floor and same thing for breastfeeding. I mean, I was fortunate enough like to be able to have colleagues who specialize in that, but I didn't know I needed help for breastfeeding. And I'm like, I work in this field, you know? Yep. And yep. so I would agree. And now again, with online resources, it's easier to get access to those things. Literally, you can get, get anything from anywhere. That's like even virtual support for me. Like I'm supporting people all over the world now. Totally. So you have access. No matter where you're at, you have access to this. Okay, so they do have it. And that was, okay, so that was how I got on my tangent. So basically, I was talking to a client. And I was like, you need a pelvic floor therapist. Ask your doctor for a rec. A lot of times I have a question here. Colby says, shouldn't our OBGYNs tell us a little about this? You want yeah. to that <laughs> I mean yeah they should and um, however I think oh. that you know I don't expect our OBGYNs or our midwives to be specialists in pelvic floor what I expect them to do is to say you need to see a pelvic floor specialist because mm -hmm. I'm not an OB nurse or you know a lactation consultant but I have resources for my patients to say you need to go see these people proactively yep. and postpartum and I think that that's the same way if we're looking at care of the whole person you know, who cares for the pelvic floor? Like once you have baby, we're like, okay, baby's here. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> and so I think that that's where we really come in, that it should be. And again, in other countries, it's standard care to see postpartum PT six weeks and then ongoing. And then now we're seeing women more during birth to help prepare them for birth and postpartum. Mm -hmm. so we'll well, and I, think it, I mean, I can speak from the nursing side. We're just not taught about this stuff. Right. I didn't know, literally, like I'd been an OB nurse for like five years before I heard that there was such a thing as a pelvic floor therapist. Yep. Like no wonder you're OBG and I don't know what OBGYNs learn in medical school and in their residency and stuff, but like, especially if they're an OB just delivering babies, like we don't talk about it on the floor. Yeah. I can tell you that I've never had a conversation with an OB about pelvic floor, nothing. So they're learning. I think they're learning from their own experience because I think patients, um, community members are going in to their practitioner saying, hey, I want to see a pelvic floor therapist. The other thing is there are PT locators on the internet. So even if you go on my website, I don't have a locator myself, but I have links to other locators that have PTs all across the country and across the world so that you can find one in your area mm -hmm. and you know where they are. Yep. I love it. I love it. Okay. So back to the thing. So we're there, you're at your appointment and you can expect, I do this for my like vaginal exam, anything <laughs> <But you> can <laughs> expect that they would go inside and literally assess not like this, but like, you know, like, a, mm -hmm. um, gently, you know, it's very yeah. gentle. It's very respectful. You're not in stirrups. I use real sheets. There's no paper gown. I mean, part of this is comfort. I mean, we're at, we're, we're connecting with people in a really intimate way. And I think it's important to help them be comfortable during that process. So, you know, we'll explain what the exam is. We'll go over the pelvic anatomy, just like I explained to you all. And then we'll do an intravaginal and or intra intrarectal assessment and just see, are these muscles tight and tense? 
Are they soft and weak? Are they coordinating properly and contracting when we need them to contract and relaxing when we need them to relax? Okay, beautiful. I feel like that's very helpful to understand. Um, okay, so they've gone, They maybe they haven't gone to see you yet, but they're like, ooh, I'm considering going to see a pelvic floor therapist because maybe I have some issues. Um, what about for prenatal prep? So I'm seeing some questions also on the side of like, I'm pregnant right now. Oh, I, there's somebody that says I pee when I sneeze. I haven't done any pelvic floor exercises. Like what, what do I do other than see a pelvic floor therapist? Yeah. Like what are your recommendations for that? So a couple things are, again, it's preparation. Like we don't ask our bodies to go run marathons without having prepared and you're not doomed. Like, this is not like, oh my God, you're peeing your pants. You're going to end up in diapers. Like, no, this is just about these symptoms give us information. This information is, oh, there's something that could be a little bit different, a little bit better, maybe let me look into that. And that's where you see a specialist. So um, I have, you know, when you do see a pelvic floor therapist, I would ask them, do you do childbirth preparation? And a lot of us go over different positions to birth in, how to use your breath to kind of push during um, crowning or giving birth to the baby. Um, you know, um, if you're having pain, if you have pubic symphysis pain, tailbone pain, low back pain, like different positions that can help make you comfortable, all of those things kind of leading into birth. And then also things to help open your pelvis. Um, I will always remember this. I was in the hospital um, with a close family member and she was, you know, laboring and I was saying, hey, can we get this peanut ball? Can we do this? And, you know, I think probably overstepping my bounds as a family member. And she was like, why? You can't open a pelvis. And I was like, oh, no. Yes, you can. And so it was one of those things where I'm like, you can open a pelvis. You can use positioning and pillows and balls to help open your pelvis to allow baby to better descend in the birth canal and optimize birth, your birth experience. So you know, my thing is to never say this is the way to do it, but it's really to give people options for their birth experience so they know what they what they may be able to do. And then and specific all to their pelvic floor, right? Specific to their pelvic floor. And then, you know, teaching them how to push, how to use a mirror so they can see what opening up the pelvic floor looks like. Um, have their partners come in to also help with moving a leg, perineal massage, postpartum recovery, how to take your first poop after having a baby. I mean, like all the stuff no one tells you. Totally. Totally. So what's the deal with Kegels? I mean, so our Kegels, Kegels recommend <laughs> is I have tons of questions about Kegels. So our Kegels recommend, and first of all, what is a Kegel and are they recommended for pregnancy and postpartum? So Kegels are contractions of your pelvic floor. So again, if we go back to this model, this muscle sits like a basket. When you do a Kegel, these muscles contract. So kind of shorten and then lift up. So it lifts up those organs and kind of closes the urethra and vagina and anal sphincter. So yeah, we are actually doing, you know, we do Kegels all throughout the day before a cough or sneeze. Sometimes those muscles automatically turn on or when you're doing kind of core exercises, you sometimes pull those muscles in. Do we need to be walking around with our vaginas tight and our tummies pulled in all the time? Absolutely not. To strengthen a bicep, you don't just hold your arm like this, right? right. So right. Kegels are contractions if you need to strengthen and then you wanna relax the muscle completely just like you would any other muscle in your body. Now, not every person needs Kegel contractions. Yes, if you do have some weakness, Kegels are likely gonna be an exercise that you learn to do, but then you learn to incorporate into other things, into squats, lunges, um, push-ups, picking up your babies, picking up the stroller, lifting Costco boxes. Like you can't just do Kegels till the cows come home. You have to actually learn how to use the muscle throughout the day. Yeah. But not everyone has weakness. A lot of people have tension and they need to learn to relax the muscle before they learn to strengthen. So how would you teach a Kegel? I, so my most common cue, so if I do it- like, Let's do a Kegel, all so of us. So Everybody one thing, to do a Kegel. I'm I ready. would sit up with a nice neutral spine. You don't want to be slouching. You want to kind of- Yes, that's me. Pretend like I'm your client. I'm going to move myself back. So I want you to sit up with a nice neutral spine. So no slouching. Okay. And you want your feet flat on the ground. You don't want your legs crossed. And then when think about your pelvic floor, it just sits between your two sit bones. And I want you to think about sucking up a smoothie with your vagina. Okay. <laughs> and it's a lift. I, I saw that Instagram post of yours and I was like, what? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no. and it's totally here. 
it's yeah. totally weird. When I saw it, I was like, oh, a smoothie. But I was like, oh, a smoothie. And so yeah. it really gives you that connection of it's a lift off. It's not tightening your tummy or holding your breath. It's okay. a. So I'm going to, I'm going to take a big deep breath in. So and I like to start with a breath in first. So you're going to inhale, Sarah. And on the exhale, you're going to exhale. And I'm just squeezing like my pee muscles. Yeah, but it's your anus and your vagina together. So Both my and the back butt hole you. and my vagina hole. Okay. So you're so not tightening your tush. It's just a subtle contraction lift off. The way you would like hold in gas and hold in pee. On the inhale or the exhale? <laughs> exhale. Okay, so. Inhale, exhale, suck up the smoothie with your vag. And then let go. Who's doing it with me? <laughs> so it's, it's like lifting weights, basically. I'm squeezing up back. and then I'm releasing the weight. But, and with, when you're weight lifting, you're not like, right. It's a da, 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 da. Okay. Yeah. So, and but then you should feel very not intuitive to do it on the exhale. Like I want to breathe in and then breathe out. Is there a reason for that? Yeah. So the way that this works, and I'm going to stand up to show everyone, but your diaphragm is here underneath your ribcage and your pelvic floor is kind of down here at the very bottom. When mm -hmm. you inhale, your diaphragm goes down. So you inhale, your diaphragm goes down and your pelvic floor goes down. So with a contraction, we want your pelvic floor to go up. So it's inhale, exhale. So you get better lift of your pelvic floor when you're exhaling. Now, if it's a lot to think about, it's kind of like walking and chewing gum and rubbing your tummy and all those things we want people to do. Sometimes I'm just like, forget it. Forget the breath. Let's just work on the contraction. And then you can start integrating the breath. Okay. okay. Really yeah, it's a cylinder. Yep. It's like a cylinder. And so you inhale and then exhale. And on the exhale, pelvic floor lifts up. Now, one of the most important things, the reason I incorporate breath into it is because people don't often relax their pelvic floors. If you are breathing, your pelvic floor is going to automatically soften and let go. Like a so, Yeah, and you're not pushing. You're not pushing out. It's just a very opening. It's an, a big breath of your diaphragm opening your ribs and then relaxing it. Because how, how many people like walk around? Floor? What's that? How does the be big deep breath open my pelvic or soften my pelvic floor? Remember the, the, the cylinder, if you inhale and take the breath in, your pelvic floor is gonna soften and relax. It's gonna sink a little bit lower and let go. So if you have a lot of tension, that breathing helps it let go. And then, does that make sense? Got it. So if somebody's working on just relaxation, the first thing I'll start them with is the breathing. If somebody's working on contractions, I'll work on the breathing, but then the contraction on the exhale. So in theory, Let's just say that I don't have the resources. I don't have any access to anything. There's, it, I see it as like twofold, that there's the strengthening side through like say Kegel exercises and or can we say like other exercises? That other strengthening core exercises, yeah. Core exercises. And then there's the breath work side to relax the pelvic floor. Are there other ways to relax the pelvic floor? There are. So, you know, um, breath is where we start because it's mm -hmm. something that's really accessible for people to do every day. Um, the other thing is stretches. So what is the best way to relax your pelvic floor? Like, what do we do when we, what position are we in when we give birth? Knees oh, up, legs. right? What position are we in when we try to poop in the woods or like use a squatty potty on the toilet to poop? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Knees are up. So bring yeah. your knees upwards, like getting into a squat position, getting into top, like hovering over the ground, like a deep squat. Like if you ever do yoga, it's called, yep, just like that. Yep. Okay. So that position, child's pose in yoga. Okay. Okay. Um, that that softens your pelvic floor. It lengthens and relaxes your pelvic floor. Because I'm pulling things open, right? The best position to relax the pelvic floor is squatting. Bring your knees up to your chest. So if you think short and tight is like legs together, legs crossed. If you think soft and open, it's knees up kind of child's pose, deep Does squat. it matter if my knees are open or closed? You'd want them to be wider, wider than your, yep, just okay. like that. So like this, which, so in pregnancy, in theory, this is one of the reasons why squatting, people talk about squatting throughout your pregnancy as like stretching, but really, yeah. I mean, I'm in a supported squat right now. I could be here for a very long time. If I was right. away from the couch, like my balance <laughs> gets a little off. But you, you know, to, you don't have to be, you can sit on a yoga block, you can sit on a stool, a you book. can use the counter to hang on to. Um, I like this. This is actually yeah. lean against the couch. Yeah. 
So and this is good just for stretching and prepping the softening side of the pelvic floor for pain. Right. Yep, okay. and so like during third trimester, this is what I have people start to do. Um, if they don't have any like pubic symphysis issues, for how long? Like, a minute or two and just breathe. Okay. You can't just like do it and like watch Game of Thrones okay. and be all stressed out. You gotta like soften and relax and breathe. And, you know? I mean, I do feel like my vagina's like kind of hanging. So that's <laughs> not hanging, optimal. But it feels like more pressure, not hanging. Yeah, like no, <laughs> I don't have a vaginal prolapse. <laughs> but like that, it feels like there is more like weight. So if it, if it is something where somebody, so it just depends on the person. Again, a lot of times we're instructing people um, on this in person, but then I would say, try it lying on your side and just bring one leg up, kind of like a knee to chest stretch or try it on your back and bring your legs up so that you're so not- So bringing knees back is really the key to one yeah. leg stretch. And so think about it, a child's pose, a squat, you know, happy baby, it all kind of just puts you in that squatting position just in different planes and then helps you, and you breathe in that pose. Okay. So, and you know, this is the theory when we have women bring their legs up when they're pushing to give birth is you're trying to open the pelvis yep. to yep. allow baby to exit. Which you can open the pelvis. You right. can open. And my legs, you can change the dimensions of the pelvis. That's one of the things we teach too. So we're, we're working on it on yeah. those nurses. So oh, okay. the word. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, okay. So I have had my baby. I pushed, I had a little tear. And I am wondering now, like, let's say I'm four weeks postpartum and I'm like, eh, I'm like, I'm worried that I have a pelvic floor issue. First of all, what are some things like that you see that are pretty common in the specific to the postpartum period? And what do people do about them? What can they do about them? Yeah. So I think a couple of things, if someone is pushed for a long time, so like the second stage of labor is the pushing phase. If you're pushing for a long time, often people have prolapse, which is when the organs aren't as well supported. And it feels like heaviness or pressure in your vagina. Like it gets worse at the end of the day. Um, it feels like you need to like put your hand over your vag and like lift it up or something. And it can get worse with lifting or working out. So um, that could be an indicator of pelvic organ prolapse. And so that's when I would say, you know, you need to work with a therapist to learn how to connect with those muscles, start strengthening those muscles. We use different like braces and there's like a thing that looks like a jock strap for your vagina. You can wear like all these different tools and devices we have to help you navigate healing. Mm -hmm. um, so prolapse is a big one, especially because women are pushing for a really long time sometimes because they're very confined to bed. There are medications that can kind of slow down the process and they're often lying on their back versus maybe hands and knees or on their side, which can facilitate some more opening. Um, the other thing we see is leakage. We see those sphincters aren't closing as well as we'd want them to. So it could be leakage of urine, sometimes leakage of poop if they had a more severe tear. And that's again, a sign of like, hey, I would just be proactive and start seeing someone versus like just hoping it gets better. Mm -hmm. And then probably one of them, I guess two more common ones, abdominal separation. So diastasis recti. Again, we don't think about pelvic floor when we think about abs, but they're connected. Um, really common during pregnancy, really common during postpartum. And then um, scar tissue, scar tissue at the perineal tear, where scar tissue does not heal and move the same. I mean, it heals, but it doesn't move the same way that your, um, your tissue pre-pregnancy does or pre-birth. So we do a lot it's of- like cartilage. Like I like to think about it like earlobe versus cartilage that like healed skin is yeah. firmer than an earlobe. Yeah. So again, if we're like it's trying to put something in the vagina and it's not, it's not going or it's causing you pain, yeah. that could be a sign that you need to do some softening to that tissue um, at the base of the perineum or the base of the vagina and also cesarean scars. Again, that scar can heal, um, but it's stuck and it's really stiff and that can lead to bladder issues, bowel issues, painful sex, all that stuff. So those are some really common ones that we see. So basically though, in theory, like whether you have a vaginal delivery or a cesarean, there likely is some sort of trauma to like, you have a scar from the C-section or maybe you have a tear, let's just assume. And if you had an intact perineum, then great. Um, but in general, it's not uncommon for women to tear. In theory, would you recommend that once they're healed that they're, they do some massage and like scar work? I would recommend that everyone sees a postpartum, sees a physical therapist between six to eight weeks postpartum. like. Okay. It is a huge change to your body. And I don't even call it trauma. It's just change. Like you just went through nine months of pregnancy. 
-hmm. surges of hormones, then birth, either vaginal or cesarean. And then like, there's no follow-up. So I'm like, how are you supposed to know how to rehabilitate your body when you're taking care of baby and then going back to work and taking care of other children? Like just some basic education on how to pee, how to poop, how to lift, how to exercise. Like those things I think can be really helpful. Um, I don't sit, tell everyone start massaging their perineum right away because there's a lot of kind of um, outliers or situations where the scars not heal. There could be granulation tissue where I think you really need to just make sure you get clearance from a physician before yep. working yep. with a PT or doing any self-scar work. Mm -hmm. But you can do scar work. Yes. That is a thing. And that honestly, as a nurse, never heard of it. I'm here, here I am in my squat still. <laughs> yeah. But the other thing is, and it's also never too late. So if you're like, oh my gosh, I'm four years postpartum or I'm two years postpartum, like it is never too late. I've seen women decades postpartum and we still make significant changes because no one's ever worked with them. And they're like, why didn't anybody tell me this sooner? So it's yeah. never too late. Postpartum is forever. You can always get support. Yep. I love, oh, how freeing for so many of these women that just think they have to live with peeing themselves and wearing a pad the rest of their life because they're so worried about it. Yeah. I mean, and the other thing is, is that like these, you, we may not get you totally dry, but we can at least help you prevent it from getting worse and give you tools to help you do the things you want to do, like socialize or exercise or have sex. I mean, we're avoiding a lot of these things because we feel embarrassed by these symptoms and they affect our lives. So, but there's definitely help for them. Yeah. Okay. Last but not least, um, let's talk about sex, baby. <laughs> so as far as painful sex, because there's the prolapse, so the weakness side yeah. There's mentioned like pelvic or organ prolapse. So that could be your vagina, that could be your bladder, that could be your bowel, that like, mm -hmm. that would mean that they, they are loose. And then I, I, yeah. there's a, how would you say that in a PC? You're much more PC than me. Like, um, there's laxity to the tissue. <laughs> there's just more laxity to that tissue. Again, that hammock is just not as supportive as we'd want it to be. Mm -hmm. So then there's the other side of, especially for the postpartum period and, or even for women who maybe have had painful sex their whole life, like what are the options for painful sex? Why is it painful and how do they live their best life and not have painful sex? Such a great question. So tell us all the things. I know. I'm like, in the next hour we'll cover. Okay. So, um, muscles. Just like any other muscles in your body, they can get short and tight. If these muscles in your pelvic region get short and tight, um, it can lead to difficulty inserting something into the vagina. And that why would they get short and tight? So if we think about, sometimes I get neck pain, right? And like that causes me headaches. For some people, they just hold their tension in their pelvis. So it could be prolonged sitting, it could be impaired posture, it could be there are butt clenchers and they just like keep everything tight all the time. It could be trauma. It could be sexual trauma or abuse. It, trauma could be a fall on your tailbone. Um, you know, it could be endometriosis where they've got some gynecological issues that cause tension in the area. Scar tissue from other surgeries. There's so many things. Um, and also fear and anxiety. I mean, it's definitely not a situation where it's all in your head, but if you've, you know, maybe been told your whole life, this is bad, this is bad. And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, let me try. And you're like, ah, it hurts, you're likely guarding your muscles. Yep. So yep. again- like You're creating the tension, but it's like more psychological of like, it's hard to release and like- just It's like, a protective mechanism for your body, which of course if something, and then if you have pain, the next time you ex try it, you're gonna ex expect pain and then you may tense again. So it's kind of this really interesting cycle of like tension and pain and anxiety, mm -hmm. but it's a very real pain. It's not just like, oh, chill out and your vagina will relax, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You like, no, not, that's dismissive. Mm -hmm. um, so what we do is we teach people to relax their muscles. And that may start with doing a lot of external massage to the pelvic area, sometimes abdominals, inner thighs and buttocks. Those muscles may also be tight. And then we do intravaginal work as well. We may work on the muscles externally and then inserting our fingers into the vagina to press on those muscles to help them soften. Just like you get a massage to rub on your, the knots in your shoulders. We do the same thing, but intravaginally. And there are also these little devices called um, vaginal trainers. They look like dilators or um, tampons of different sizes. So we teach people how to insert them into their vagina and then they go home and practice that until they can get to larger and larger sizes so they can you know, tolerate a speculum or they can have intercourse or they can insert whatever into their vagina they want. Mm -hmm. So um, even preparing for birth or you know, healing after postpartum to soften the scar tissue, just things to help them learn how to not tense 
and soften the muscles when something's inserted. And then a lot of the stretches I just talked to you about, yoga stretches, breathing, squatting, all those things. Interesting. I think about like, and maybe, I don't know that there's an answer to this, but in processing that, I think about being in the hospital and being a nurse and I come across a patient whom I, she hasn't seen pelvic floor therapy and she, I go to do a vaginal exam and like, like there are, there are women whom like you go to touch them and they're guarding and they're running away, you know? And so yet for birth, like they have to, first of all, push a baby out. There's that like psychological side. And to me, of course, I'm going to link this to sexual trauma. And if somebody is, has that kind of a, an aversion to a, a vaginal exam, I'm automatically going to to be extra careful and aware that there might be some history there. And so like, I'm going to change my care accordingly, potentially, you know, like I'm always, I'm, I just assume that and you treat everybody with that kind of respect to their body, yeah. self-determination for their body, um, which is like a whole nother side YouTube situation. So, you know, but I have a patient there and I, I cannot check them. Um, you know, and I, they're, they're really resistant to vaginal exams. They tense up. It's super painful. And so from a nursing perspective, and then the patient perspective, you have the patient who really truly has such a hard time with vaginal exams. They're extremely painful for them. Do you have any tips for those types of patients and or nurses in dealing with those types of patients? Yeah, I think it's a great question. So I think that the one thing is that we need to work really, just like you said, we need to put Patients are not the passengers in their care. They are the drivers and we are the assistants. And so I think that that is my biggest challenge as a medical provider myself is when I hear patients coming in and they feel like there's things being done to them versus them giving consent to participate in a medical assessment. Yeah. And so one, I think explaining why does this need to be done? You know, saying, even if it's a handy dandy drawing, like, hey, this is what we're looking for. This is what we're doing. This is what you can expect when you do it. I mean, I know I've gone to my gynecological exams and I don't even meet the physician until I'm like clothes are off and sheets on and stirrups are in. My hands never shaken, eye contact's never made. And before I know it, he's like under the hood. I'm like, well, that's really, un that's not really gonna put me at ease. So I think one is communication. Um, explaining the exam, and then two, asking consent. And then three, I mean, go to the breath. I mean, I think like we know that that breathing can help soften, physiologically can help soften the pelvic floor. So teaching them how to breathe, how to maybe even say, okay, do what a contraction is, see if they can contract, and then even have them practice bulging like they're giving birth or having a baby. And that's kind of an opening and a, a eccentric, you know, relaxation of the muscle. So if they can do that, they may that may facilitate better better insertion. Also try one finger. Do we have to have two in there? Can you just do one? Or do we need to have to have one? Do we maybe, you know, in the future we say, you know what, this is not, let's go work on this, see a PT, whatever, and then come back and see me again. Like these are things that, you know, again, it just gives us information about that patient's body, about where they are. Try a couple tools to see um, and then see if that's helpful. And again, look at their positioning. Are their legs straight up? Maybe they need to relax their legs on pillows and help their legs and soften. wait until the legs are relaxed. That's such a, cause you see them, they're like this and you're like, okay, drop your legs and you'll see nurses push these opens, you know? And like, that's only going to like, Oh, hold on. I don't have a choice. Yeah. Like let them take a second to relax their knees open in their own time and, and, and pillows or have people to support them have pillows in the room oh, again yeah. lighting are they staring at super bright lights are there five people in the room i mean we don't think about the effect that these things have on people because we're just going about our day and putting fingers here and there but it's like there's a human on the other side so you know i think if you try all those strategies and you're still having challenges you don't force it this is not something that's absolute mandatory at that time. But in the other thing, like try some of these things, try a heating pad under the back, pillows under the knees, um, you know, soften the lighting in the room, have them practice a couple deep breaths, all these things, explain to them what's going on and then see if you're able to make a different approach. Mm -hmm. I love those tips. And for <laughs> nurses, especially, cause of course, like I'm kind of in nursey land with mentorship stuff over here, but also for you patients that like you can set yourself up if you know that you have a hard time with vaginal exams. First of all, that's okay. And second of all, like to prep your nurse and say, look, you know, I have, I have a hard time with vaginal exams. They're not easy for me. So what I've learned to work is it's helpful if maybe we could lower the lights. And if I had enough time to like set up my body and really do some breath work and soften everything out, and then I will tell you when I'm ready. 
Yeah, huge. And then, you know, if I see patients who are going in for their first vaginal assessment, you know, I have them use these little trainers of vaginal dilators, like before the assessment, the morning of. So it's almost like warming up. It's like training for a race, you know, like you do a little bit of stretching before you actually go yeah. on the race. So doing some of these prep work if they are in physical therapy. And the other thing, I mean, we this is a condition. This is a medical condition. This isn't like a roll your eyes. Roll, I mean, like, I think as medical providers, we have a lot of work to do in the compassion department. And so I think, you know, putting, empathizing with our, our patients and, and giving them what they need to be able to participate versus just having things done to them. Mm, girl, you preaching now. <laughs> oh, with you. Oh, couldn't be any more with you on that. Amen. Cool. Well, thank you so much for being here. I, um, I want people to be able to connect with you. So tell everyone what you offer, what they can have access to through you and how to contact you. And then I will link everything in the description box down below for your future reference. Yay. Thanks, Sarah. So um, on Instagram, which is probably where you'll find more content and activity on the period vagina whisperer. Yeah, so the vagina whisper with periods in between. Um, there okay. isn't a vagina whisper out there, so don't be confused. Um, <laughs> and then my my website is thevaginawhisper.com. And I'm so excited because we just launched a new one yesterday, which has just easy access to find online courses. So we have online courses for um, pelvic floor preparation for birth, cesarean birth preparation, postpartum recovery, diastasis, recti, painful sex, you know, all of these things that you really can get support and education at home. We make them very accessible, very affordable because we really feel like everybody should have access to this information. Amen. And then we do um, online consults as well. So one-on-one -on -one consults okay. if someone feels like they do want one-on-one -on -one help um, or, you know, we don't have an online course for what they, they need support for. I love it. I love it. Well, reach out, find your team guys, find your tribe and your pelvic floor therapist. If you're pregnant now, it is never too early to get this person on your team that can work with you through your pregnancy. And then you have them for follow-up postpartum. It's like prevention is so much more important than actually having to deal with a prolapse issue or some sort of problem into the future. Do as much as you can pick up what you can control, and then we'll let go of the rest and then if you want more from me, of course, you're my little spiel. You can go ahead on over to Bundle Birth. I'll link everything in the description box. I'm not going to say much more than that. But thank you so much for being with me here today for your time and your expertise and your love for this community and for these men and women and birthing people all over the world and our nurses um, and for sharing just your heart with us. Hey, okay. thank you, Sarah. I of appreciate course. everyone so much. Thank you. Hope it was helpful. And don't forget to flex and flow. And I will see you soon. Bye, guys.